Welcome to the Agatha Christie in Devon podcast. I'm Matt Newbury. And I'm Sophie Pierce. And this podcast is all about the places that Agatha loved and which inspired her. So we've come to the former site of Ashfield, which is where Agatha Christie was born and grew up. And it's remarkable to come to a place where an author that went on to sell two billion books and is known the world over started her life. And yet it's all a bit sad because uh, her house is no longer here. Um, We're standing by the blue plaque um, outside the site and there's a great big fence in front and we're looking through to some sort of rather uninspiring 1960s flats. But, you know, this is where her life began and you have still got a little glimpse of the sea. And there's actually a rather lovely quote from her autobiography about how she felt about Ashfield. She wrote, I remember, I remember the house where I was born. I go back to that always in my mind, Ashfield, how much that means. When I dream, I hardly ever dream of Greenway or Winterbrook. It is always Ashfield the old familiar setting where one's life first functioned. How well I know every detail there. The frayed red curtain leading to the kitchen. The sunflower brass fender in the hall grate. The turkey carpet on the stairs. The big shabby schoolroom with its dark blue and gold embossed wallpaper. I chatted to Hilary McCaskill, who's the author of Agatha Christie at Home, to find out more about Ashfield. She described it as a very ordinary villa but actually it was a very large house on the edge of the Devon country lanes. So it was a house with a a big view. It was an accidental purchase because her mother was left in Torquay while her father went off to New York to do some business. The idea was that they would then move to New York. But meanwhile, as she was looking for a house, a temporary house, she saw her mother saw this house and uh, fell in love with it and bought it on the spot. So father rather surprised. But for Agatha, it was a very happy home. As she was a much younger child, she had the house more or less to herself and the gardens. There are pictures of of the inside of it, which one or two of which are in the book. It's very cluttered. There's a picture of the living room where there are lots of collections of things which actually ended up at Greenway. So one can still see these collections. And she continued this uh, Hobby, a hobby of collecting that the family had started. And it had it had almost two acres of gardens to play in, which is, must have been amazing for a young girl. It was, yes. I mean, she loved the woodland. I mean, that she, she even towards the end of the, her life, she was still remembering particular trees, like the Wellingtonia, which was a redwood, and um, beech, beech tree, where she used to eat the beech nuts quite often, and the monkey puzzle tree. There, 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 were, there, were, there were three trees that sort of cropped up throughout her life, you know, and, and in, in her books, she, she mentions these occasionally. Um, there was the greenhouse as well, where, where the rocking horse and the horse and cart were kept. And she had imaginary friends and she, she played on her own, um, but she had all these friends. So she was quite cross when her nurse told the cook about some of the friends because it was personal to her. She, she credited it with giving her the imagination that she later developed it was a, quite a terrific thing that that she it stayed with her all her life. I mean, her last book, Postern of Fate, published in 1973. I mean, the, the background is the garden and the house. It's she's just is conveying her memories of it, really. So, as I mentioned, we are actually here at the Blue Plaque, you know, marking the site of Agatha's family home. It's great that there is a Blue Plaque here, of course. That's right, but there was actually a bit of a mystery around this plaque in 2019 when it went missing and all the local papers were going, where's Agatha Christie's plaque gone? Actually, it was just the Torbay Civic Society. They'd taken it away to put on a larger piece of granite. So that's the one we can see today. Glad it hadn't. there was no a foul play at work there. <laughs> but um, yes, thinking about her childhood, there's a really interesting author called Rachel Trathui, who actually lives locally, who's written a book called Mothers of the Mind, which is all about the mothers of three famous 20th century authors, Virginia Woolf, Sylvia Plath, and of course, Agatha Christie. So Matt spoke to her about Agatha's family background. Agatha's parents were Fred and Clara Miller. And unfortunately, Clara had a rather unhappy childhood. Her father died when she was very young and her mother, because she didn't have much money, allowed her wealthier older sister, Margaret, to adopt her. So Clara went to live with her aunt in a big house in Cheshire uh, when she was only nine years old. But she was desperately homesick and missed her mum and her brothers. 
and it gave her a rather sort of melancholy disposition. She sort of felt that she'd been rejected. And I think that stayed with her for life. However, the one thing that made it better was her aunt Margaret's stepson, um, the American Fred Miller. And he was this sort of dashing young man who came over and visited. And he was kind to her and he said she had lovely eyes. And at first when they met, she was just a little girl. But gradually she grew up and they fell in love with each other. And they were opposites, really. She was really intense. He was very laid back. But it worked. And in 1878, they got married and it was a very happy marriage. So what brought them to Torquay? Well, I think they came to Torquay after their honeymoon and I don't think they were intending to stay. At that point, they were considering going back to America to live. But they fell in love with the place, particularly Fred. He liked the sort of laid back, luxurious atmosphere. And he was to get really involved in the town. You know, he got involved in the cricket club. He went to the yacht club a lot. He sang in local choirs. He did amateur dramatics. But for Clara, Torquay really became home when she found the house of her dreams, which was Ashfield in Tor. And she found this lovely seven bedroom villa with distant views of the sea. And she'd always been looking for her own home. She'd always not felt she had that as a child. And once she found Ashfield, she had that sense of belonging she'd always been looking for. And that was her world. So um, Agatha Christie had two older siblings, didn't she, first? So. Yes, she did. Um, they were very different. Madge was this sort of golden girl. And there was quite a lot of competition between Madge, the older sister, and Agatha. Because Agatha said um, Madge seemed to be good at everything she did. She was good at acting. She was good at writing. She said that Madge's wit seemed a lot quicker than hers. And in fact, Madge was the first in the family to be published she had some of her short stories published in a national newspaper, Vanity Fair. And she was also the first to get a play on in the West End, The Claimant, in the 1920s. And Agatha did feel quite competitive about it. But they also got on well and they were quite close. And in 1902, Madge married a very wealthy man and got this lovely house again up in Cheshire. So Madge did very well for herself. In contrast... Agatha's brother, Monty, was a real problem. He was the black sheep of the family. And he was a real worry to Clara always. Um, they sent him off abroad. He worked abroad. Um, he became a soldier. He went to Kenya. And then during the war, he was injured in the arm. And to deal with the pain, he started taking drugs. So he came back to Torquay and lived with Clara for a bit in Torquay um, and was addicted to drugs. And it became really embarrassing because he'd sort of shoot his revolver out the window at Ashfield as <laughs> visitors arrived. I mean, I don't think he meant to kill them, but um, it was a bit off putting. So in the end, they moved him up to Dartmoor and put him in a, a bungalow, I think it was, with a housekeeper. And at least that took the pressure off Clara. But he was always a liability. So Agatha had quite a peculiar upbringing when she was young, uh, especially in terms of education, didn't she? Yes, yeah, she had a very solitary childhood, which I think actually helped her become the writer um, that she did. Um, she was educated at home. A lot of girls of her generation were. But unlike them, she didn't have a governess. She was taught maths by Fred and her history by Clara, her mother. And Clara did it in a pretty unorthodox way. Instead of using textbooks, she used novels, which actually fired Agatha's imagination. Agatha did meet other children a bit. Um, she went to singing and dancing classes, did some Swedish gymnastics, but she didn't really like mixing with other children that much. She was very, very shy and she preferred being at Ashfield in the garden and having her imaginary friends. And she made up these stories around them. And it was the perfect um, childhood for a writer. She lived in a fantasy world at that time and it gave her the skills which made her the great novelist she became. So we've left Ashfield and we're actually uh, walking a route that Agatha would have walked a lot as a child. So we're walking along towards Torquay Cricket Club, where her father, Fred, was very much involved, wasn't he, Matt? Yeah, he was a member and later the vice president and he would take Agatha here and she would love watching him playing his cricket matches. And if she was lucky, he would let her keep score. And she used to sit under a big, the shade of a big old oak tree to keep that score. And actually, it's now called Barton Cricket Club and they've got the oak tree in their logo. And actually, we're now just coming into the club and we're by 
where the old oak tree used to be but sadly it's not there and there's a little sapling in its place what happened there Matt? Well for years the tree was diseased and they did everything they could to try and uh, to try and protect it and uh, unfortunately during a heat wave a couple of years ago the tree just collapsed um, so this used to be a form of sort of pilgrimage for Agatha Christie fans from across the world but they have planted this new tree so hopefully at some point there'll be a big tree there again and people can sit there and sit in the shade just like Agatha did. Yeah it's lovely that they did that um, and as we mentioned, you know, Fred, Agatha's father, was a great figure in her life and um, he died when she was just 11. And we spoke to Rachel Tathui about how that affected her. It was awful for the whole family. Fred was a really loving father. Agatha had two doting parents. And when I went to the Christie Archive in Wales, I found these letters from Fred to Agatha, which were just so loving, just oozing affection and she would write loving letters to her father and in fact he kept them with him always when he died they found one in his wallet from his little girl uh, so she always knew she was very loved by both parents and she said fred was a very easy person to live with he was comfortable in his own skin and he felt she felt that she was actually more like him than she was like her mother who was a little bit more angsty and nervous um so when fred died when, as you say, Agatha was only 11. It was terrible. It was the end of Agatha's childhood, really, because not only did she lose Fred, it also changed Clara. Clara had been devoted to her husband, and at first when he died, she wanted to die too. But her love for Agatha pulled her through, and Agatha and her mother came back to Torquay and lived together, but it was very different. There was less money because... One of the problems with Fred was he wasn't good with money. So they had to cut back on their staff and there was less entertaining. And it was much more isolated at that point because Madge had gone off and got married. Monty was away and it was just the two of them. So she pretty much grew up in a household of quite strong women uh, following her father's death. What, what effect do you think this could have had on her character? Yes, there's no doubt she grew up in a matriarchy. After Fred died... Auntie Granny, Aunt Margaret Miller, um, came to live with Clara and Agatha. And they were all strong women, but they got on actually very well. And I think this experience gave Agatha the greatest respect for women. And I definitely think it affected her writing. She was used to hearing her mother and grandmother um, talking about everything under the sun from servants' love lives to serious matters like religion. And I think this sort of tuned her ear to be able to write very realistic dialogue. She also got some of her morality, which comes through in her books from her grandmother. She used to read newspaper articles to Auntie Granny, and Auntie Granny always liked the rather salacious stories, but she always looked for a moral slant on it. Um, and it was interesting because Agatha was certainly no feminist. She was brought up by her mother and grandmother to think that the most important thing to do was to marry the right man and keep him happy. However, in the Miller household, the women had always really been in charge, but they pretended the men were because they said, you know, that men's egos required them to pretend that they were the ones who really mattered and who made the decisions. So Agatha was brought up with that attitude. However, although she was never a feminist, she was very aware that women were as intelligent and equal to men. And, you know, she didn't just become the greatest writer um, of everyone other than Shakespeare and the Bible by chance. She was, she and she knew it, very bright, very talented and could be as successful as any man. But she didn't believe in the ideology of feminism. She believed in doing it in practice. Well, we've now come to All Saints Church in Tor, which is a lovely, a late Victorian church. And uh, we're just wandering now down in front of it. And this is a Hugely significant in Agatha's life, this church, Matt. So, yeah, so Agatha's father, just before she was born, donated a sum of money to build this church here. So the original parish church wasn't considered to be big enough. They wanted a bigger one. He put a sum of money in so that Agatha's name would be listed as a founding member of the church. How amazing. And then there's a, an actual uh, sort of foundation stone here, isn't Yeah, there? so this is dated 1889, the foundation stone. And Agatha Christie was born on the 15th of September, 1890. So the year before she was born. Incredible. So if we wander into the church now, um, it's a lovely sort of haven away from the busy sort of streets of Torquay. Um, a beautiful 
um, 19th century church made of sandstone with a wonderful smell of incense. And mm. we've been talking to the people who love this church and, and they made the point that this is really completely unchanged from when Agatha was here as a child and indeed as an adult. That's right. So it's the same architect who built Truro Cathedral. So it's got a real high church feel to it, hasn't it? But yeah, really remarkable place. And one of the first things you see as you come into the church is the baptismal font, font uh, which we can see here, which is... Um, Very grand. It's petty tall marble, apparently. It's a black, beautiful black marble with sort of brown marble legs, quite ornate. And this is where she was actually baptised. That's right. She was baptised in here. And if we, right next to the font, there's a little copy of her baptism certificate... Uh, so we can see uh, Agatha Mary Clarissa Miller. Uh, and what's interesting is that the name Agatha wasn't chosen until on the way to the church. So this is two months after she was born. <laughs> Agatha didn't have a name, and they bumped into a family friend who suggested the name Agatha, and that's the one that was used. And what else is interesting on here is Agatha's father, Frederick, his occupation is listed as gentleman. Uh, unlike the, uh, the previous baptism, when the, the father there was a coachman, so... Interesting sign of, um, you know, Victorian society, I guess. I'm Father Peter March and I'm the vicar of All Saints Tour. We're in this absolutely gorgeous church where we know Agatha was baptised and there's a big That's family right. connection. Do you get many people coming because of that connection? We do indeed. Uh, when the International Festival is held, uh, we, we open the building to make it available to visitors and have had visitors coming from all sorts of different parts of the world, many different countries, because uh, as we know, Agatha's work is, is uh, celebrated and enjoyed by people from all around the world. And there was a parishioner, I believe, who did actually remember Agatha. Absolutely, yes. Uh, uh, remembered when Agatha worshipped here, as she did um, from being a child who was baptised here to being a young woman until the time that she married and moved away. And yes, we had a parishioner who, who remembered back to those times uh, and remembered where Agatha uh, regularly sat uh, and was part of the worshipping community here for many years. How wonderful. So do we know where she did sit? Indeed. Was there, do you want to sort of Indeed. walk up? the aisle a little so way. So if we walk along here, um, it, the legend has it, the <laughs> wisdom is that she sat here, uh, uh, which would be quite a wise choice because it's next to one of the radiators <laughs> and as anybody who comes to church knows, they're not always the warmest of places, particularly in winter time. So this is held to be the place where Agatha regularly sat when she came here to worship with her family. So we're about one, two, three, four, five, six from the front. That's right. And I think people like to get wanted to get their photo by that in that very queue. indeed we have had uh, tourists here in fact a group of tourists from japan who came uh and uh, they wanted to have their photograph taken sitting in the pew where agatha is believed to have sat so we're now sitting in that very pew and it feels rather lovely to think of her actually busy physically being here all those years ago. So she used to come to this very church with her father and describes in her autobiography how it was one of the highlights for her week. And the first time she came, her father said, now, if you want to leave before the sermon starts, just tell me, and that's absolutely fine. And when it got to that point in the service, he whispered to her, do you want to leave now? And she shook her head vigorously and held his hand and tried not to fidget and stayed for the entire length of the service. Which is such a nice story because you tend to think of Victorian fathers as being very stern and uh, doer and, you know, children seen not heard and, and would be made to sit through the, the sermon and he obviously wasn't like that. No, she describes him as being a very agreeable man and I think it's a very loving relationship they have between the two of them. So now it's time for uh, one of the features that we're going to be having regularly in the podcast, What Christie Means to Me in Three, where we ask a fan or an expert why they love Agatha Christie so much and all in three minutes. Uh, so we're going to be hearing from Kemper Donovan, who is an American who has a podcast called All About Agatha. I love Agatha Christie because she is quite simply a genius. She was a brilliant writer, one of the very best at constructing my favorite kind of mysteries, which are puzzle-based mysteries with clues that the reader can use to read actively to figure out who done it at the same time the fictional investigator does. There are a lot of reasons why Christie was the best at this type of mystery. The readability of her prose is something people still dismiss or misunderstand to this day. Christie was actually an excellent stylist 
And it's remarkable how readable, hence timeless, her books really are. She was also an expert at the fine art of cluing, which often involves a tricky misdirection in her books, uh, which she pulls off flawlessly over and over and over again. Personally, I love the fact that her clues are often layered into the written medium itself and hiding in plain sight, which makes her solutions seem that much more inevitable and obvious when we come to them. I call it sometimes the heel of hand on forehead moment where the reader can't believe they didn't figure it out for themselves, uh, you know, that the author pulled a fast one on them yet again. Christie did this so, so very well. But for me, the biggest reason is that in the best Christie's, an understanding of character, of who a person is at their core, is key to arriving at the solution. And there's something very pleasing in a readerly way about this. Reading Christy closely with care is a rewarding experience. And as a reader, I love that aspect of her books, the fact that Christy took her craft seriously and always treated the reader with respect. I think there are also a lot of reasons why Christy continues to endure as much as she does to this day beyond the high quality of her work. A big one is that her prodigious output has been adapted in so many different media and for so many years now. Uh, she has become a familiar commodity even to people who have never read her or who rarely read her. There's a certain amount of pearl clutching that goes on about this in scholarly or readerly circles, but in that these adaptations keep Christie fresh and relevant, I don't think the importance of their existence can be overstated, honestly. And I personally am always overjoyed when a new Christie adaptation or continuation story or what have you makes its way into the world. More is more where Agatha Christie is concerned. So thank you to Kemper Donovan from the All About Agatha podcast. Yeah, lovely to hear what he had to say. Matt and I have now come down to the harbour, which is really like the heart of Torquay. It's beautiful, with all the boats and the strand opposite. Uh, it's actually undergoing quite a bit of redevelopment at the moment because they're making a new pedestrian area around the clock tower. And what's really lovely is that there's going to be um, a new bench with a statue of Agatha and her little dog Peter as part of the bench, and this is by Elizabeth Hadley. So you'll be able to come down here and, and sit on the bench with Agatha looking out to sea, which would be lovely. So Agatha loved it on the Strand when she was young. So she would walk from one end, which she had a department store called Bobby's, and she'd go to the other end, which had a store called William and Cox, which is now Hooper's. And she would shop passers-by because she'd walk with her young friends without wearing gloves, which was a massive social faux pas back then. Scandalous at the time. <laughs> Well, we've just come a short distance actually over to Victoria Parade. So we're by the row of shops, but we're still by the water. And this was the scene of one of Agatha's most favourite things as a child. So every August, the Royal Torbay Yacht Club would hold their annual regatta, uh, which was obviously a great source of excitement in the town. But what Agatha really loved was uh, the regatta fair, which took place right here where we're sitting. That's right. She got so excited about this that she'd start saving up her pocket money, probably from back in May, uh, and to come and spend on the different rides and the different stalls down here. It was absolutely, yeah, a hive of activity. So there was a merry-go-round, there was a coconut shy, there were stalls selling things like um, pink and white coconut ice. Uh, but for Agatha, the real highlight was the little penny monkeys you could buy, which were like little fluffy representations of monkeys that you could pin on your coat. She got really excited as well about the uh, the evening firework display. So they had uh, the family had friends that lived very close to the harbour and they would go up to the house and she'd be allowed to stay up for the nine o'clock party and they would serve her lemonade and ices and biscuits and watch the fireworks together. So must be very excited for a young girl. Absolutely. So we're nearly at the end of the podcast and Matt, I think it might be time to go for an ice cream very soon. I think that's an <laughs> excellent idea. <laughs> it's been wonderful um, learning all about Agatha's childhood and sitting here, you know, in Torquay and thinking back to her childhood here. You can kind of see why she became the writer she did and how this place basically inspired her and fueled her imagination. So we're going to leave the final word with Rachel Trithewey. I think Torquay was a perfect sized town for an author to observe. And then, as now, there were a lot of very interesting, colourful, flamboyant people in the bay. And this fired her imagination. I think also being by the sea was very much in Agatha's blood. And as we mentioned, she swam a lot. 
and liked being in this sort of seaside atmosphere. They were involved in the yacht club. There was always the regatta in the summer and all the social events around it. And I think her affection for Torquay has shown that even once Ashfield had been sold, she chose to come back to this part of the world and bought Greenway. And I think her mother had done what she intended to do for Agatha. Clara had never had that sense of belonging. She gave it to Agatha. And Agatha always wrote about having roots. She said she never suffered from a lack of roots. And those roots were here in Torquay. This podcast was recorded on location in Devon, England in June 2024 and is brought to you by the Agatha Christie Festival. It was funded by Torbay's Local Heritage Grant Scheme. This is a collaboration between Torbay Council, Torbay Culture and the English Riviera UNESCO Global Geopark with investment from the National Lottery Heritage Fund. Thanks to our guests, Hilary McCaskill, Rachel Chithui, Father Peter March and Kemper Donovan. Original music and design by Rob Hoskins at Design by Hoskins. Join us at the Agatha Christie Festival every September on the English Riviera. Visit www.agathachristiefestival.com. Music